44th Annual Book Fest. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Cindy Weil, the new director at the Center for Children's Literature at Bank Street Museum. At Bank Street, we feel very honored to be hosting this wonderful event for the sixth consecutive year. I want to thank our colleagues at Bank Street who did so much to make today possible, especially our library team, particularly Kristen Frieda, Director of Library Services, <laughs> Lindsay Wyckoff, Allie Jane Bruce, and Mishy Thomas. We'd also like to welcome back two of our colleagues, Lisa Von Drasik, former children's librarian, and our colleague Jenny Brown, former director, for those of you who don't know, former director of the Center for Children's Literature. And of course, thanks to our amazing book discussion leaders, volunteers, and the esteemed authors and artists presenting today, we're greatly appreciative of your time and contributions. A few details. For those of you who would like to tweet, our network is events, password connect at BSC, and please use the hashtag BookFest15, that is all on the back of your program. Andy Latiers and his team at the Bank Street Bookstore will be selling books by all of the authors and artists presenting today in the lobby. If you have not been to the new bookstore at 107th Street and Broadway, we highly encourage you to do so once BookFest is over. <laughs> this year, we're offering the opportunity to purchase three raffle tickets for $5 for the prize of two tickets to our BookFest conference on censorship on April 16th. This is a $150 value. A second prize includes a $50 gift certificate to the Bank Street Bookstore, as well as a copy of our Best Books 2015 list, a $10 gift card to Orange Coffee Roasters, and a Bank Street Coffee Cup, an $80 value. <laughs> our three third prizes are a selection of Best Picture Books, Best Works of Young Adult Fiction, and Best Concept Books, each a $75 value. There are men's and women's restrooms on this lobby level and also on the fourth and seventh floors where book discussions will be held. We ask that you please stick to the discussion group to which you've been assigned and also the lunch selection you have chosen. Both are indicated on the back of your name tag. If you have trouble finding your way around, ask anyone with a sunburst on their name tags. I would also like to call your attention to an exhibit celebrating Bank Street Centennial in the lobby, developed by our archivist, Lindsay Wyckoff, entitled Lucy Sprague Mitchell, in her own words. We'd like to thank our generous sponsors, Abrams, Algonquin, Candlewick, Charles Bridge, our coffee sponsor, <laughs> Chronicle Books, Cinco Puntos Press, Club Leo en Español, Scholastic Reading Club, sponsor of The Green Room, Harper Collins, breakfast sponsor, Macmillan, Margaret, Margaret K. McEldery, a division of Simon & Schuster, Paula Wiseman Books, Simon & Schuster Children's Publishing, and Rachel Zucker for donating books by her mother, Diane Folkstein. So now I will ask the first group of panelists to take the stage. And it's my pleasure to begin the morning. Our first panel discussion, Teachers as Writers, will be moderated by Leonard Marcus. Leonard Marcus is one of the world's leading writers about children's books and the people who create them. His award-winning books include Margaret Wise Brown, Awakened by the Moon, Dear Genius, The Letters of Ursula Nordstrom, <laughs> Show Me a Story, and more than 20 others. He is a frequent contributor to the New York Times and Hornbook. Exhibitions curated by Leonard include the New York Times, the New York Public Library's landmark, the ABC of it, Why Children's Books Matter, and the current And the current Wonderland Rules, Alice at 150 at Philadelphia's Rosenbach Museum. 
Leonard will interview Adam Gidwitz, G Elizabeth Bloomley, and me, Cynthia Weil, writers who are also teachers. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I've never introduced the person who introduced me before. <laughs> there's always a first time, especially in progressive education. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'd like to uh, begin by uh, telling you a little bit more about um, Cindy Weil, um, who has lived in Vietnam and Mexico, and other places, earned a doctorate at Teachers College, Columbia University, is the author of a series of concept books which make use of specially commissioned Mexican folk toys um, in order to um, present um, basic concepts to young children. Um, look forward to talking about that uh, in the next few minutes. And she's also the coordinator of the um, Writers Laboratory, which Lucy Mitchell started um, in, the, in the 1930s where Margaret Weiss Brown was one of the first members. Um, Elizabeth Blumley is sitting next to Cindy. And um, Elizabeth has come to us from Vermont, where she's the co-founder and owner of the Flying Pig Bookstore, uh, which is in Shelburne, Vermont. Um, and she uh, received a master's degree um, here uh, at Bank Street a number of years ago, and is the author of several picture books published by Candlewick Press. I'll mention two titles, My Father the Dog, uh, which is a very witty and wonderful book, and also um, How Do You Waka Waka. You have to figure out what that means. Um, okay, and she was also the librarian at one time at the City and Country School, a uh, school in the village that has a very historic association with Bank Street. Um, among other things. Adam Gilwitz is right next to me. And Adam uh, studied <laughs> literature um, at Columbia and also received a master's from Bank Street. Uh, has taught for many years at St. Anne's School in Brooklyn Heights um, and um, now uh, continues his association um, telling stories, reading to the kids at that school um, each week. Um, and is the author of um, Tale, Dark and Grim, and the sequel, or follow-up book, The Grim Conclusion, um, among other books, also a recent book based on Star Wars. Um, and um, so, and I would say about his books that they both honor uh, traditional stories and also um, make them sort of humorous, insightful, um, gives, gives them a, a twist, which um, is very refreshing. Um, so, um, I want to start by asking everyone here, um, what can be taught about writing and what can't? Do <laughs> um, so you want to start? <laughs> taught about writing. Uh, I sort of learned by the seat of my pants. I, I, I had no formal training really. Um, I was a foreign language major. And my, most of my books have a total of about 20 words in them since they are. So what do you know about writing anyway? <laughs> I know how to spell. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you know, that, that can be learned. Um, well, I would say writing is a lot about what to leave out. And obviously you <laughs> love that quite a bit. <laughs> Yes, that's, that's true. Um, I learned about punctuation is very useful when there are just a few words as well. So I, I learned to leave out a lot of exclamation points, uh, limit that. Um, but my work is about the interplay of, of pictures and text, uh, really. So um, it, it's more about the imagery sure. for me. But it's also books. bilingual, which yes, makes it um, stand out from most books, really. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's such a revelation for a child who only knows one language to realize that there are other words for the very same things that are otherwise familiar. Yes, definitely. And, and parents um, who are also learning the language um, pick up the words as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So then it becomes a conversation. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth, what do you think about this? Um, well, I think you can't teach you can't teach someone to have an ear for cadence and rhythm. Um, I think people can become alerted to 
things like that, but I think there are some people who are just born writers, and there are people who are good writers and become can become amazing craftspeople, um, and then there are the geniuses who are just in their own realm. Um, I think you can teach a lot about structure. Um, I think you can teach a lot about different approaches to a, a subject or to writing, um, but I think there's, uh, I don't know, if you don't grow up loving books and reading, I think it's a an uphill battle to write really well for, um, especially for kids. Mm -hmm. When you were here at Bank Street, was um, writing a part of what you were doing? It was, I, well, we had to do a lot of writing. Is anyone here in College of Bank Street now? No? Okay. Well, I will tell you, <laughs> we, we had to do a lot of writing, and um, Sal Vassalero had a fantastic <laughs> class, uh, and I wrote and illustrated my own um, first picture book in mm -hmm. that class. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can you remember something that um, was a kind of revelation to you that became a guide toward how to make it into a finished manuscript? Oh, that's a good question. We really looked at, I think, shape the shape, the arc of a picture book, probably, mm -hmm. um, was something I looked at a lot. And then I went to Vermont College later, years later, mm -hmm. too, so some of that is melded together. Mm -hmm. um, but sure. yeah, that class was an introduction to what makes some books just magical for mm -hmm. kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Adam, do you want to? Talk um, about this? I have a couple thoughts about it. The first thought is that I, I feel a little bit like uh, Hillary Clinton on the Benghazi <laughs> panel. You know, you know, I hope I do as half as well as she did. Um, I hope we all do. Um, and I hope your questions aren't nearly as mean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> try. Um, uh, I think that it was interesting what you said about sort of, um, being born with uh, the cadences in your in your head. I think that actually probably when we think about teaching writing, we often think about and teaching adults, you know, in, in sort of uh, workshop classes, or we think about writing workshops with kids. But I actually think a lot of the education about writing comes from those early years of reading aloud and hearing stories told and hearing stories told as well. Um, and, so I was, um, I was very lucky to have um, uh, somebody who's going to be a panelist later today, Laura, Amy Schlitz, as my librarian when I was in fourth and fifth grade. Uh, so, yeah, so talk about learning what a story should sound like, right? And I was once on a panel with her and I said, you know, I remember just being mesmerized by her stories and she said, that's funny because what I remember is you crawling around on the rug. <laughs> Um, but I think that that's one way to be educated, you know, to learn how to write is, is uh, hearing. And then I think the other really major role that a teacher can play is giving children the space to imagine and play as much as possible with writing, but also just in the classroom. We do so much regulation of kids' time and kids' thinking, um, try and get the skills um, necessary. You know, the, n none of the skills that we teach as, as writers end up making people professional writers. The, what makes somebody a professional writer is their drive never to quit and their capacity for imagination day after day, hour after hour, year after year. So I think those are sort of the two ways that we can educate. Sure. The, the, you were making me think there was, um, when I was a school librarian, there was a little girl who really struggled with reading. She was seven or eight. Um, and, but she had book language, you know, she'd grown up reading, her parents read to her all the time. So she could actually, she would sound out words letter by letter by letter and somehow manage to create the word from that letter. I've never seen that before. But she couldn't read The Cat Sat on the Mat, but she could read Roald Dahl books. Oh. And I think it's because she had that book language instilled in her. Mm -hmm. So something I've noticed is that people who are in the children's book world tend to have good memories for the, their emotional lives as children. Um, it seems even more important than knowing children, you know? It's like knowing who you were at that time. I was wondering um, if you have first memories um, of wanting to write or to express yourself in some way. Um, we don't have to go in the same order. Would anybody like to answer that? Um, okay, I'll go in reverse, we'll go in reverse order. Um, I. Um, as a child, never thought of myself as a writer at all. Um, in fact, I remember having a teach uh, author come to my school for a school visit when I was in seventh grade, and um, somebody asked the author, "How do you know if you're a writer?" Um, and she said, "Writers write," um, which I thought was just tautologically brilliant. <laughs> so brilliant! It's, yeah, there's really almost nothing so else to say. Nothing else to say. That was the end of the conversation. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> 
it was the end of the conversation for me because on that day, I, I, well, I figured she meant write for fun. I figured that's what she meant. Um, and as a seventh grader, I never did write for fun. Um, of course, how many seventh graders do? Very few. And so I remember very clearly sitting in the auditorium in my school and thinking, oh, I'm not a writer, um, and I never, I never will be a writer. Um, and only when I became a teacher and started telling stories to kids did, did that change. Um, so in terms of first memories of wanting to be a writer, my first memory of thinking about possibly being a writer was I knew I wasn't. <laughs> okay. okay. I mean, I don't know if that's helpful at all. As a kid, I definitely wanted to be a writer. And I grew up in rural Connecticut, so I had a ton of free time on my hands. Um, so I, I wrote little stories all the time, trapped my mother, my father, my grandmother in the kitchen and read them. Um, so. Yes, I definitely wanted to be one. Did you have people who were um, looking at you that way, like a teacher who you know, would encourage you to put little albums of stories together? Like that? My mom was a librarian. Uh -huh. She was a children's librarian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, she definitely encouraged putting it all together, illustrations, um, book sales, all that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Elizabeth? I started a lot of stories. I have, yeah. I still have scrawls of things, and uh -huh. that remains true to this day. That um, I have started many a story, uh, and I, I have a recording from when I was little of a, an initial story. I think I borrowed a lot from Beatrix Potter, but um, <laughs> but I, yeah, I always love, I always love books. I can't remember a time before I could read, and so. Um, I don't know. I didn't really think about growing up to be a writer, but I always, I always wrote. I always loved writing. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Did you ever, any of you, meet a writer when you were young? You know, these days it's fairly common for authors to be dropping in on schools. But when I was growing up, we actually had one writer come to fifth grade, and it was someone whose last name could have been a first name. That's all I could remember for years, and it turned out to be Jean George. Oh, wow. <laughs> You know, but it made such a huge impression on me in fifth grade, you know, that here was this person and that's what she did. My parents were um, creative people. They, my mom was an actress. Um, she did everything creative really well. And my dad was a lawyer, but he also was very, he was a good producer. And so in their lives, we always had theater people and dancers mm -hmm. and I'm sure there were writers in there, but ne I never had a school visit from a writer that I can recall. Mm -hmm. But I, but. Creativity was really well supported, I think, in my family. So I was lucky that they didn't ever discourage any of those mm -hmm. early attempts. Yeah. I was, um, I was interested. You said a creative family, and it sounds like your family is a very literary family. Mm -hmm. um, also, my uh, my family was a mu musical family. My father worked for the Baltimore Symphony. My mother was a professional uh, musician for a while. Oh, really? um, but um, I was going to say about that. You're saying about oh, meeting authors and. I don't know what I was going to say about that. Except that my mother was, I mean, this is what I was going to say, but she would never encourage me to be a writer. She wanted me to go to law school, and so she was very disappointed. Um, so, um, after my first book hit the bestseller list, she uh, said, does this mean you're not going to law school? <laughs> but what I was going to say, now I remember what I was going to say, was I, writing as a kid was not something that I did. What I did was um, I played a lot, and I acted. So you were talking about the, the actors, and that was what jogged it. I was an actor in middle school and in high school. And in fact, my college entrance, uh, essay was about how important acting was to my life and I drew a line from playing with my G.I. Joes to acting as if acting was sort of the apotheosis of what my personality was and it turned out I was only a so-so actor um, and uh, but I think now I draw that line straight through acting to to writing which is I think a very similar actually activity and I can't tell you how many authors that I've met right who did yeah. acting in high school and even in college. Yeah. So many of us are sort of frustrated um, <laughs> dramatists. And I think part of the reason is that, you know, as an actor you have to embody characters and play them on stage and when you're writing you're embody characters too. So I mean another way of sort of teaching writing, you know, can be yeah. plays in the classroom and that, and that sort of thing, encouraging that drama. And so many people those overlapping. You know, histories. Yeah, no, I wanted to ask you about the, all of you about the connection between um, the books that you write and the performance. Um, like, Elizabeth, was that what drew you toward the picture book as a, as a format or an art form? I, I, I mean, so have some a of your books, background. I mean, your books are so structured dancing, and they have, performer. you know, funny words that you repeat and sort of invent meanings for and so on. Um, I, so Sound I effects. think I have a, a poet's brain more than a novelist's brain, mm -hmm. and I love words and language. Mm -hmm. And I did used to teach kids, so 
Uh, I think when I'm writing and I'm revising, I do often think about how kids would enjoy the language and enjoy, and, and I, there's a dancey element to my last two books, um, mm -hmm. that, and there's actually a song, a tune to Dogs on the Bed. <laughs> so I, I don't know that, it's not a conscious decision that I make ever, but, um, but it is part of it, and I think um, when you asked me a question that spurred something. Oh. Uh, about performance, as it relates to why you are writing these kinds of books. Oh, I well, when I um, I had my first manuscript at Vermont College, and um, I had all instead of just we were supposed to do you know graduate readings, and I had um, all of my classmates come up and act out my picture book as a story instead of that, and so I think I think I must think that way. I, I wasn't really aware of it, but yeah. Yeah. You know, I sometimes think that people, um, probably no one here, but a lot of people think of picture books as kind of iconic thing, objects as opposed to opportunities for an experience. You know, and yet <coughs> children's writing, maybe more than any other kind other than theater writing, is meant to propel the people involved into a kind of experience like that. And um, like Cindy, your books lend themselves very well to craft demonstrations, don't they? Sure, kind of performance too. I, yeah, I, I guess I, I wasn't really inspired by theatrical performance. I was um, an art history, art historian, um, trained as an art historian in college, and then I traveled extensively after that, and I just became mesmerized by uh, crafts from developing nations and. I uh, sought for ways to um, exhibit those, to show those to people, and uh, so I came at it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, um, you know, so many authors are, not, I mean, not, not all authors, but so many authors are teachers, or have been teachers, mm -hmm. um, and the, I, I think part of it has to do with knowing kids, but I also think part of it is that one of the um, hardest uh, disciplines in, during writing is ensuring that you're, and it's probably it's even more important for you guys who write picture books, which I've tried to write picture books, and they're, you guys, I mean, I've made a joke about your 20 words, but I could never write a story in 20 words, I ever tried, um, is that um, reading your work out loud as you're editing it, as you're creating it, is crucial to making, to ensuring that the quality is high, that it sounds right, that it sounds good in the ear of, of another person. And so when you're teaching, um, you're sort of forced to either read it out loud to your kids or hear your kids read it out loud, and you really have a sense of um, reading as, uh, or literature as communication um, and performative communication, um, which is really crucial, and I think a lot of authors, uh, uh, especially, you know, aspiring authors forget about that, and they sort of get lost in these huge, you know, pages and pages of just text and don't think about it on the mouth and in the ears of children, you know, coming out of the mouth of an adult. Yeah, I mean, and also in your books there's they're kind of operating on two tracks, you know, it's a kind of, the book is having a dialogue with itself, yeah. in a way, and th that actually reminds me of one of Margaret Weiss Brown's books, The Important Book, which I think was meant to provoke kids to talk back to their books. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she threw out these kind of arbitrary definitions of I things. I don't know, but tell us about the book. Um, well, she says, like, the important thing about an apple is that it is round, mm -hmm. and then she lists all the other things that you might say was important about an apple, but then it ends, <laughs> it's juicy, that it's red, falls to the ground, but then she says at the end of this litany, but the important thing about an apple is that it's round, you know, and it sounds like she's telling you what to think, but in fact, I think she's trying to pick a fight. Yes. <laughs> I mean, as a, as a teacher, that was the most, I did it all the time, I think it's one of the great things is that I was constantly lying to children all the time, um, making, you know, statements that were counterfactual and yeah. they have to fight with yeah. me. Yeah. Um, I remember one of my early um, parent-teacher conferences, I was talking to a parent and she said, oh, you know, Phineas came home and he's been using so sarcastic. I wonder where he was getting it from. And now I know. Uh, but kids do, they love to push. So, you know, I mentioned when the, um, reading the fairy tales of the kids at St. Anne's, which I, I still do. And the reason, um, I try to bring lots of picture books and lots of other books. And they don't, they've decided they don't want anything but my big book of Grimm's fairy tales. And part of the reason is we have now, it's sort of like a running show where I read, and they're, you know, calling out questions and comments, sort of like I do, making fun of, creating that sort of dialogue between, um, can, I, can I tell you, well, I'll, there's one like, very brief story I want to tell you. Sure, of course. Talking to yeah, her, no, no, no. I think it's a little bit amusing, and then I'll shut up, I promise. <laughs> um, I was telling a story called um, uh, Three Snake Leaves, a Grim Fairy Tale. 
and in Three Snake Leaves, um, a man marries a princess, and the, the condition for marrying princess is if she dies first, you have to be buried alive with her. But he's got no better prospects, so he agrees. As soon as they get married, she dies, of course. Um, when he's in the tomb with her, a snake comes out of a, um, a hole, and he's going to attack the body the snake is, and the, and the young man takes out a sword, and he cuts it up, and then another snake comes out of the hole with three leaves in its mouth, and it puts a leaf on each cut, and the snake reforms. And um, the boy sees this, and he takes the three snake leaves, and he puts one on each eye and one on the mouth of, of the princess, and she comes back to life. But when she comes back to life, she's changed. And they go on a, um, a sea voyage, and on the sea voyage, she falls in love with the sea captain. And at night, she and the sea captain pick up the young man, and they throw him overboard, and he drowns. <laughs> but luckily, <laughs> there is a, a, a faithful servant who is yet to be mentioned at this point, but he's been there the whole time. They just forgot to tell us about it. And the, and the faithful servant jumps overboard, and he, and he rescues the young man, and he, puts, and he has the three snake leaves in his pocket, and he puts them on the eyes and the mouth, and the, boy comes, the young man comes back to life. They go back to the kingdom, they meet the king, they tell the king what the princess has done. And when she returns with the sea captain, he questions her, and she admits to it. And, and he said, he was so faithful to you, and you betrayed him, that your punishment is, and I stopped, and I looked at the first, group, first and second graders, and I said, what should her punishment be? And one little girl raised her hand right away, and I said, yes, and she says, a time out. <laughs> so that was very, that was very good. And then another girl raises her hand, and, and I call on her, and she says, you should have to um, be banished from the kingdom for a whole year and never be allowed to marry the sea captain. Which was very just. And then this little boy shakes his hand, and I call on him, and he says, she should have to wear diapers for 20 years. <laughs> and then this little boy just, he knows the answer, and I call on him, and he says, um, she should be thrown in the ocean, and her penis should be cut off. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Decker voice says, Her butt should be cut off! And I'm like, yeah! That was the end of the story. So, the topic of that is very important. Education is a Yes, that's right. It's really important stuff. Girls, penis, butt, you know, this about me. So, <laughs> so, here's a question for Elizabeth that everyone <laughs> But everyone is free to answer this, too. Know. Um, booksellers are kind of, um, you know, at ground level when it comes to what people want um, to read. Um, and I wonder if you can think of books or kinds of books that people ask for that you have discovered don't exist yet. There's for children. Mob. <laughs> well, not necessarily. Uh, that is a good question. We get some very specific, odd... Uh, requests, but I'm not sure any of them would translate into books that other people would. Add. You know, I we once recommended um, Josie recommended Water for Elephants to a customer who said, "I don't like circus books set during the Depression." Uh. <laughs> <laughs> a genre that I was like, um, and, and we do get it the other way. Someone wanted to say something about tide pool. It, some, there's some kind of marriage between tide pools and knights and dragons. Or some, I mean, it's very, very specific, but I, I wouldn't yeah. point to that as a niche anyone should no. <laughs> no. try to fill. Uh, I mean, I do think um, for kids who struggle with reading, you know, they like the appearance of a thicker book, but with text they can read more easily. So that's, I guess, my teacher brain kicking in. Um, you know, kids who struggle with reading are very sensitive about baby books. Mm -hmm. um, kids who are fluent readers will read picture books in public openly, but younger kids who have a hard time with it won't. And so um, that's always a good, that's always something that is helpful. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to think of others okay. um, too. Cindy, would you want to comment on this? Um, maybe with reference to, I mean, because your books are bilingual, and so you're sort of plugged into the um, oh. the part of the reading world that is, you know, craving more multicultural books and mm -hmm. books that um, have to do with Spanish, you know, which is becoming a bigger and bigger um, portion of our population. I lost the thread of that question. Um, <laughs> uh, books that don't exist yet that um, should <laughs> exist or that people seem to want or that you would want to see um, published? Oh, people definitely want more bilingual books. Um, even English speakers want more bilingual books. Mm -hmm. um, people want to learn languages, and, and definitely there's a growing market for them. Mm -hmm. 
So the thing I forgot that's the giant thing, of course, mm -hmm. is multicultural books where, um, you know, that feature main characters of color where race is not the driving force in the narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, identity is always really important, but um, yeah, I mean, it's just such a huge, huge thing. Even in Vermont, which is one of the, you know, whitest states in the country, there's a demand and an interest and an openness to um, the world, I mean, the world we live in, it's just ridiculous that we're catching up. I think things are better, that we need diverse books. I mean, what an amazing job that this group has done in bringing that, uh, making real change happen in publishing. It's such a slow thing, and so that, I would absolutely say, um, is true. And I try to track this, I have a database, um, it's a diversity database, and it is just for those books that mm -hmm. feature main characters of oh, color where right. race is not the yeah. driving force of the story. And so um, I add to it all the time when I see publishers' catalogs come into the bookstore. Um, so that's a, there's a huge need for that. I was thinking a little more mm. narrowly. Yeah. 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 Well, the tide pools is also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I was hearing uh, Matt de la Pena, I'm going to quote somebody quoting somebody else, but I was hearing Matt de la Pena, who you probably all know, wonderful YA and non picture book writer, and he's been really articulate about this diverse um, book. Uh, movement, and he was quoting Juno Diaz, um, so I'm going to quote him quoting Juno Diaz, Diaz so it's completely um, inaccurate, um, but Juno Diaz talked about, um, you know, all the monsters, he used to love monster books when he was growing up, comic books with monsters, and all monster books, you could always tell a monster because um, they, when they looked in a the mirror, there was no reflection. And he said he grew up reading books where he was never reflected in the books, which, you know, what better could make him feel like a monster, like a freak, than never seeing himself reflected in the books. I thought that was just about as powerful a way as you could say it, um, as, as you could. Yeah. So you all um, have contact with children, a lot of children probably. I was wondering um, if there's something about the lives of contemporary American children that you wish could change, something that's happening to a lot of children across the board, which is troublesome in some way, um, that you would hope could be made better? Where do we begin? It's true. Um, prior to coming to Bank Street, I spent a lot of time working with teachers in their classrooms. Um, in Harlem, the South Bronx, um, Washington Heights, and I, I'm so surprised by, um, I guess the, what I'm concerned about is uh, where curriculum is going, and uh, teachers no longer have control over what they're teaching on a daily basis, um, and they aren't able to introduce books that uh, are, are really appropriate for the children in their classrooms. It's sort of what, you know, what's on page 45, oh yeah, I got to do this book. Um, so I, I'm really sorry for that and I'd love to see that change. Um, because of media saturation and kids' access to iPads and, mm -hmm. and computers and things, I think um, there's a sophistication, sort of a slick sophistication that's mm -hmm. creeping lower and lower. Um, and the kids developmentally are still, um, they're not there. I mean, I think we, there's a lot of snark and there's a lot of um, <laughs> smart alecky stuff, which is very funny and it's great in small doses. I mean, I'm the first to, you know, I don't know what, I like funny, edgy humor. But I also think that uh, we are trending so much toward that, that actually we're almost afraid to address things with heart. Mm -hmm. And kids are becoming afraid to say they like anything. Isn't it? Um, so I feel like, the, and I think I see that in picture books, I see there are books that um, go over the heads of the young children they're intended uh, to reach are the books that look like they're for really young children, but in fact are for older kids and adults, um, and we all find them hilarious, but they're either too subtle for kids or they're not meeting them where they are. And one thing I loved about Bank Street and Lucy Sprague Mitchell and um, Lucy Culkins, um, and the, that whole theory is that sort of meeting kids where they are, that those everyday books are harder and harder to find, um, like the Shirley Hughes books that are so wonderful. They're just hard, harder to find, but they are where kids are, and I think we still need those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, 
I would add two things briefly. One, you mentioned with the iPads and stuff. I think that these days a lot of people think that um, kids playing time is kids screen time. This is the same thing, and it's such a such a horrible tragedy because the screens are fun. And you know, I played a computer game last night, but um, <laughs> but um, you know the time to create your own worlds as opposed to entering into a world that is totally created for you and is visually already fabricated so that the imagination level goes down, down, down is a real problem. I think that hand in hand with that sort of screen obsession, which is, I mean, all of us, like, you know, we say, how, how come kids are using screens so much? Well, we're reading articles about it on our phones while we're worried about why kids are using screens so much. And they, I learned it from you, Dad, right? Um, the other the other thing that goes with it is, I think, in, in the school that I used to teach at St. Anne's, um, so it's less true maybe uh, in other communities, is the um, over budgeting of a kid's day. You know, the you know three activities after our school every day, um, and again, it reduces the amount of imaginative and free time because we're plugging them into worlds that are already created by other people mm -hmm. as opposed to letting them create their own. That is really, 19 years ago when we opened the store um, and kids would come in and buy a little plush toy, not a book related one, but just a, you know, a dolphin or something. They would name it, they would give it a name they had come up with. My mom had a doll named Wobbly Susan, which I just love. Um, and nowadays kids will look blank if you ask them, you know, like, what's, what's your pet? Or like, what's your, what's your friend's name? And they'll, um, they'll either spout off the brand, you know, the name that the TV cartoon it was based on gives it, or they just start kind of blank dolphin. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I know that's such a tiny thing, but it does seem to reflect to me that we are, the kids aren't cr generating as much imagination yeah. time right. for themselves. It's not really, yeah. they don't see it as theirs to do. Yeah. 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 My brother had a little moose, a stuffed moose, and he's five years old, and he named it Horny. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother and I kind of looked at each other and went, oh, it's cute, it's great. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, <laughs> Once again, it falls to me to change the subject. I just want you to earn your, earn your keep up here. Come on. So, we just have a little bit of time left, and I, I do want to, I've mean, answered so many questions that you all have to ask. Would a few people like to raise their hands and ask away? Yes. What's the Lisa, end? hi. Okay. What Adam? you got to tell me what happened to the princess. Ah, uh, yes. What actually happens to the princess? Uh, she and the sea captain are put into a boat, and holes are drilled in the bottom of the boat, and it's sent out of the ocean and drowns. And they drown. Which is the right, yeah. All right. Uh, who else has a question? Somebody must. Yes. Um, since you all have worked and, and, and do work with children, have there been any children who've inspired stories of yours? My nephew is the one who asked, how do you walk a walk -a? when he was about 18 months old. And we didn't know what he meant. We said, how do we walk? And he just shook his head. We didn't know what he meant. So my sister-in-law, who is a, like a flamingo, made this funny, flappy uh, movement with her arms, and he thought it was hilarious. And then we all had to come up with our own individual waka waka. So yes. Um, I started writing down the Grim Fairy Tales because I was asked to by a student of mine. Um, so. Um, after she heard a story like the one I just told you, she said she wanted to hear more like that. Um, uh, and then in my third Grimm book, The Grimm Conclusion, I actually insert a scene from my classroom, my first graders, um, who were, you know, insane and uncontrollable. Um, and so I put them into the book so that no one would ever forget how terrible they were. <laughs> so maybe one or two more? Sure. Good. Uh, we have just a little more time. Uh, yes. Um, just, just a thought, I think it's interesting that you're suggesting that kids maybe aren't producing as much original content because so many adults now are producing you know, a lot of self-publishing. So I wonder if that's in some way connected. Maybe there's this oversaturation of everyone telling so many stories. <coughs> I'm just, just curious what, what you might think about that. I mean, I don't think that there could ever be enough, uh, too many stories told. I think it's just the way that we force kids to to accept them or, you know, shove a screen in front of their faces so they're constantly processing them. I think everybody wants an opportunity to make their own stories, and kids need that opportunity more than anybody else. Um, and then they have to come to the stories that they love sort of with some, you know, willfulness and some intention. Otherwise, um, I think the power of the story is less, um, is diluted, you know. 
I mean, I think human beings are just are pretty much made up of our stories and our connections to other people, and that's really what we boil down to. So if we're just feeding stories, we're not encouraging kids to tell their own stories. Um, I think they lose out with that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. You all spoke about um, the direction that education is going in, which is very conservative and, and very uh, sad. I'm just wondering, do you have any suggestions about how to shift that so that we can get back to where it needs to be? Mm, big question. I think we need our political leaders to understand how education really works, and instead of all this testing, testing, you know, I, I mean, I just, I, I don't think they do. I, I don't know anything about Canadian politics, but I was amazed to see that Trudeau yes. just elected was a school teacher. And I was like, yes, so let's see if, I mean, who knows, he's now a politician, so who knows what happens. But it would be pretty cool if we elected a lot more school teachers and saw and librarians and saw what happened. I do think the pendulum is starting to swing back. Uh, you know, I do. I, I think that people are very frustrated with the current state of things, and, I, and, and I'm starting to see it slowly move back. So, keeping my fingers crossed. Okay. One more. Okay, then we'll have to say it's the end. Yeah. As a school librarian, a teacher, and a storyteller, I am so. You should run for president. That's. <laughs> I love what I do. <laughs> Dealing with grown-ups is a whole other issue. <laughs> but when you submit your books to publishers, one of the things that has driven us crazy is that they will take excerpts from your books. So we are no longer getting that story arc. Oh. And stories are models to think with. Which publishers? They, what do you mean? For like uh, educational textbooks? publishers? Well, in texts, in the Texas. common core curriculum, gotcha. they take excerpts. Yeah. They are depriving you of your voice and your story. And our royalties. Yeah, <laughs> and I think it's very important that authors do stand up and say, no, you may not excerpt this. If you want to use it, you use the whole thing. Mm, interesting. So you have a political voice too, use it. Mm. <laughs> okay. well, thank you very much. This is great. Thank you.